morning time, so it's kind of an experiment. And we are super happy to have Kosuke Kawaguchi with us today. So Kosuke was uh, one of our speakers for Vox Day Singapore last year. And we were trying to have him come again this year, and then the conference was canceled because of the uh of the virus situation but we thought let's still do like some uh, like a virtual meetup with kosuke uh he is based in the west coast so it's like afternoon time for him that's why we made this time walk uh and he just joined a new company called launchable uh and we'll be talking about open source so yeah kosuke i think you can take over yeah all right, so um, yeah, so since this is a you know, quote unquote nice cozy small room, um, so I kind of hate to turn, like uh, make this like a one way thing. So feel free to interject and like I you know, shoot some like insert your narratives. I think that'd be more fun. All right, so um, so let me first kind of introduce a little bit of myself. So I'm uh, you know I am um, so I and open source go way back. Um, you know, I was originally grew up in Japan, and then uh, I moved over to the U.S. Uh, and thanks to the job opportunity here. And then that, that kind of the, what made that possible is actually my open source work that I did on the side in Japan. Um, and then you know, then I went to some some microsystems for a while. Um, you know, that company doesn't exist anymore, which is a shame. But at Sun, so I was um, part of the team that effectively became a guinea pig to open source Java EE. So there are like you know, so that kind of shaped my uh, work at Sun. And also, that was around the same time I was having lots of uh, side projects in open source. One of them eventually became Jenkins, um, and so that created that allowed me to kind of leave the sinking ship that is the Sun slash Oracle, and then uh, join the, uh, the, well, be a part of the founding team of a new startup called CloudBees. Um, and then, so that gave a lot of interesting experience for me. So in every part of the life, like I feel like open source was a part of my journey. So like, in, from, so you probably, hopefully you didn't be surprised why I feel um, like a, such a passionate love is open source, you know, I felt like it gave me a voice as an engineer to speak to the world. You know, oftentimes I think we are like, you know, we don't really have audience except for the open source. Like you know, when you can connect with other developers. Um, and also you can compete at the world stage, right? If you feel if you feel like you're good, you're good at what you do, then that, there's no faster way to show it to the world that through the open source. So I felt like it created this incredible level playing field. And you know, in Japan where I came from, like it's not really a part of the world. It's not a well, you know, in, when it comes to tech scene, it's not a part of the well-connected world. So like, I felt like the open source kind of gave, helped me break out of that. Um, and then, you know, I'm also feeling like I'm connected to the world everywhere I go, that could be Singapore or Europe or India. Like I know people who are from there. Like I was involved in some capacity in some open source projects. And that's a wonderful feeling. Um, and then so I owe that to open source as well. And then finally, like every human being, I think derives some joy out of making somebody you can see happy. And I think often in engineering, we are kind of disconnected from our customers, you know, like the people we are making happy, right? Except for open source, when like you can directly interact with people using your stack and they often appreciate what you're doing. So that was also a great feeling. So again, like all, all in all, like I just love open source. Um, and I, you know, so I also think that like open source is the best software development model like you know, mankind has ever invented. And that's a strong statement. But I mean, if you think about the fact that, for example, you know, the open source project gets worked on by so many different people, you know, and that diversity, the many eyeballs effect as I just called it once. Um, I feel like that's, you know, I think you can demonstrably see that the quality of the great open source projects are far better than most of the proprietary software projects. Um, and, you know, open source project also tends to have uh, this like a long running more continuity. Like it's not on the, um, it's not, a, it, it, it doesn't fall into the victim of a whim of the management direction change or like a new CEO deciding what else to do. Like open source has kind of a way of keeping on like a stable environment to make the good engineering happen. And that's often hard in a commercial environment. Um, and then we can have you know people around the world like a participate to kind of push the same ball forward. You know the incredible speed of adoption and feedback cycle that it creates, and 
you know, I, I mean, I can't go on and on, but really, like, just look at all these projects that we depend on. Um, so from the like, Linux kernel, that's like ubiquitous on the cloud to the GCC tooling chains to whatnot. Like, it's all, um, it's all pretty amazing if you think about it. So I feel like there should be more open source projects. I want that to thrive more, but but I think there is this like a challenge that's kind of fundamental to the open source, which is, um, you know, because we live in the uh, capitalist society, right? So something being good and great as a cause is not enough. Like we have to be, like it has to kind of, like the gear has to mesh with the economic reality. So this is um, um, the a quote from one of the Japanese guy. Um, I don't think he's actually well known outside, but, um, uh, uh, so what he said, in, and I'm kind of translating here, is like you know, the economy without morality is, is a crime, right? Like a, a, just a pure pursuit of interest without thinking about the good is not okay. But likewise, the pursuit of morality without economy is also just a delusion because like it just not, it's, you know, it, it can't happen. And I feel like at times, like all people who feel like who believe in open source sometimes forgets that this economic reality exists. Um, and then, so that's something like I wanted to kind of talk about here today, which is to say for open source to strive you move more. And then I gave you the reason why I wanted to strive more and I hope some of you feel the same way. You know, more people need to understand how open source can be a viable part of the business, not just some good thing that we do on the side or like a for social good, right? And then to tell this story, I kind of need to go through the history of open source first to kind of lay the context. So the scene, the first scene that starts is uh, 1985. I think it was, our, in fact, this was the age before the world open source gets invented. Uh, and this is set in Boston, okay, in the Eastern coast of the uh, United States. Um, and so there was this movement, it's almost like a revolution to win the freedom. And that was kind of how it was pitched by this man, like Richard Stallman. Um, the, the, the basic idea is like, you know, his slogan was almost like, you know, users needs to unite and the programmers needs to unite to get, take their fate back into their own hands. And so that was almost like um, the mantra and the slogan. And then that was a banner under which this whole GNU thing happened. Um, and then that was, um, well, I guess for people here, you know, GNU need no introduction, but you know, the, the mental picture of these people, I think is pretty more like a Star Wars, you know, like you have these rebel warriors, small in numbers, but they're very smart and they can outwit and fight with the galactic empire and the guerrilla tactics. And that's really what the GNU is kind of like a mental picture of that. that. So you can imagine like the, that kind of like a stance of the very strong ideological appeal to some people and mostly like a college people, right? Um, you know, it's like, a, so screw is economic viability. Like forget the business. The whole idea is like, we want to build this thing where everyone can use for free. Like it's amazing, right? Um, so no wonder it caught on in universities. Um, and then, like, as I said, like a great many software are written under this banner, you know, and the a little bit of silly mascot uh, that we use still to this day. Uh, but and that was that was that was back then. That was the beginning. Um, but you know, just as a side note, like, do you remember how this like a Richard Stallman got kind of sidetracked? I think it was a uh, maybe last two three years. You know, he he wasn't even like he made some somewhat insensitive remark to uh, I think uh, like a child sex trafficking crime or whatever. Like he wasn't even part of it. He was just making a third person commentary. And then that offended enough people, and then like MIT, like a quickly kind of cut him out. So that was I was kind of shocked to see this icon, um, this icon who kind of built the entire era of open source, got cast aside that easily. And that sort of speak in some sense like uh, about how times have changed, right? So okay, moving further along with the time. So now it's like another eighties, like the nineties and two thousands. So the next generation of open source expansion um, actually came through Microsoft, but not because Microsoft helped it, um, because Microsoft acted as a common enemy to unite like everyone else. Um, so, and then you can't really imagine from today's Microsoft because like they somehow became a good guy that like everyone loves. But you know, back then, so for those of us old enough, we'd remember like back then, 
Microsoft was called the evil empire. People used to use the dollar sign instead of S, the Microsoft S. Uh, so that's how people hated it. Um, now, but you know, evil or not, like it was a really mighty, powerful software empire. Um, and then a lot of people, like myself included, felt like they're on track to the world dominations, kind of like how you know the Amazon might be feeling today. Um, so quote unquote, the smaller companies, and when I say smaller companies, it's companies like Sun or IBM or Oracle. They, they simply, they couldn't compete with Microsoft on their own. So they needed to work together, right? Um, and then, so, but so how did they, they come together? And like, they found their interests aligned well up, like aligned very well with these freedom fighters that I mentioned from like a GNU. Um, so that's how this whole, like this era, that's how this era of open source was shaped. So, Apache, like originally, Silverka sort of was created as a place to run the HTTP server. Like that, that was the namesake. But, um, but the uh, Sun and the IBM, like those two companies, when they were exploring how they could work together, uh, like somebody decided that, okay, this open source foundation, maybe we could use this as umbrella to like uh, bring people to work together. So because, you know, the, this back then, it wasn't common for these companies to work across the uh, the corporate, you know, corporate boundaries. Um, so people were like, okay, I guess we could try. And then that was the XML, uh, XML parser project. Um, so it was kind of close to where I was at Sun. Um, and then that's how the Apache kind of completely changed, morphed into something different and then kind of paved the way for Apache that it's today. It's like a big umbrella of so many open source projects. Um, and then, so this model of creating a foundation um, for the open source, kind of started. And then that brought a lot of you know, other foundation that I just didn't hear. Um, and then that built the whole, another era of open source. I'm sure like many of you use many of projects that came from these guys. Um, but you know, like don't, don't make this mistake that like the, this is, this wasn't just, you know, like a, the long, like a developers working on the weekend and night shift to, to promote the public good, right? This has almost like a Game of Thrones uh, diplomacy with like uh, the war and like the people like uh, shaking hands in one hand, but like a uh, fighting is another kind of thing going on. Um, so quite, you know, there was a drama with this diplomacy, like an uh, ego, like a uh, bigger than life figures. I was like, all these dramas here. And then I was, I was fortunate to kind of watch some of them unfold right in front of my eyes. Um, so like many open source developers of this era, actually were fully employed, you know, highly paid engineers who are working for some of these tech companies. Um, so like I, I, I'll give you um, like one interesting story, um, at least for me. So back then, so XM, take it's no passer that I mentioned, right? Like it's a pretty, well, uh, well, it's a, it's a small piece of software um, that only does one thing, parsing XML, so like how, you know, high boring, right? I mean, but back then the control of XML parser brought so much influence to various XML standards that you can define. So some of these vendors like IBM and Sun, they wanted to kind of shape the direction of XML into their own liking. So they needed to be able to control this parser that so many people would use. So they not only, so they, they spend a lot of, you know, like a number of smart engineers working full time on this XML parser. And we even have like, Apache even have like a two, actually three separate XML parsers at one time because like a demand was so high. And of course, like we know, we all know what happened to XML, right? Like it was like completely forgotten on the wayside around like a 2000 something. So when the interest moved on, uh, these people, these companies stopped investing in these projects. So, so now Apache is like with like uh, the two separate like the external passive projects with a small number of people. So, but what was amazing to me, and then what happened was like these two group of people figured out the way to join their efforts together. So now they like consolidated their effort to, uh, under one banner versus two. Uh, so it inherited the name from one and then like it brought in like a bunch of code from the other. So that's kind of like a high. Know, the the, the uh, marriage could happen, right? So I felt like, wow, that was, this was a great power for open source. One, you know, like a, these tech companies who have this competing interest, they're trying to influence the you know, future of the technology. Back then, XML was that. Um, 
But this open source project was able to kind of hold together and then turn that into a positive moving forward. And when the interests move on, like they didn't like rip apart, they were able to kind of band together and utilize the remaining resources as well, and then keep, kept on going, right? So external parser is no longer a sexy thing, but it's still something that a lot of people use is, so thanks to this open source. Um, so that I thought is another like a story that shows the power of open source. Um, and then this was also around the time the open source development model had shifted. So back in the days of GNU, um, it wasn't, it wasn't like this open source wasn't actually, you know, the collaborative places with pull requests and things like that. It was more like, like a one super hacker driving the project and then like uh, other people helping what they can, right? Like Emacs, you know, the uh, uh, Gosling or um, a Stallman. Uh, VI was invented by Bill Joy and so on and so forth. So lots of projects are like that. Uh, but as more people started participating in open source, this kind of model simply didn't work very well. So um, this was the time like the whole notion of the cathedral versus bazaar got invented. And then so the open source paradigm kind of shifted to something that we think of today, which is lots of people scratching their own collective itch, and then like a whole thing becomes bigger and more valuable. Um, like you might even call it like a mob programming or mob development. And then the, the theory was given to kind of celebrate that idea, um, which was uh, Eric Raymond's uh, the famous manifesto. Um, so that idea is open source. It got even bigger because like it helped it remove successfully remove some of the bottlenecks. Um, and then uh, but I think the good example of this like uh, is probably a GCC and LLVM. So GCC was original GNU like a compiler project. Um, that was back then huge. Um, and then the LLVM came along more liberal license, but more, um, more, it was designed to be more, um, you know, the modular, which allows more people to develop like a simultaneously. So people are able to expand it in so many different crazy ways. Like some people even ported the dissolver to uh, JavaScript and, and uh, you, you saw those things. Right? Like, all of these things was made possible and they made LLVM more valuable. So now, like at some point, I don't know exactly when, when that happened, but at some point in the past, you know, LLVM clearly took over GCC in terms of the value, speed, you know. Um, so that's, I think, is a reflective of the, um, uh, the like open source parallel change in this era. So, um, and then came the next era. Um, and I think of this as like a era of open source startups. Um, so, uh, so, you know, I mentioned like how open source can get to like a worldwide adoption incredibly quickly. Um, I think the recent example of that might be like a Docker or, um, or um, I think Elastic. Um, so, uh, you know, the, so when you're number one um, in any space, um, you can do a lot of things, and I can tell you that because, like, I saw the you know, Jenkins really grew to these huge things, and that allows me to do so many things that's otherwise impossible. So, um, so you know, so the thinking was, well, you know, like, so long as if you can, if you can sort of like, a, if you can effectively own this like a number one project that everyone is using, and you can get there incredibly fast, maybe within like a year or two. And then like somewhere along the way, if you can only figure out how to monetize somehow, like hand wave somehow, uh, then like you'd be amazing, you'd be building amazing business. So that was the you know mindset of the uh, open source startup. Um, and then, I mean, in some sense, it's like incredibly naive, but at the same time, like it, yeah, that was the prevailing thought back in the days of um, the you know, kind of startups in the dot com and so on. So, a lot of companies came out of this era that like some of them, I think the names, like popular ones are like a Spring, you know, Javos, Red Hat, I think the Feud Source, like the HashiCorp. Um, some of them survived, like not, some of them died, but um, you can see like all of these guys, like um, kind of left some work. Um, and then Cloudby is like the company that I, you know, helped find, helped find. That was also kind of came in at the trading end of this, this effort. So, uh, I've seen for in the first round like how interesting, such challenging it is to try to monetize open source. Like we did everything from like a support training, like enterprise version, like a services, um, all of that. 
Uh, but um, so that was clearly like, you know, these companies spent a lot of effort making open source better. Um, so that was great. Now, I, I kind of find it ironic that, that the, 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 um, the venture capitalist, like that's like a symbol and icon of the capitalism, pushing, like a funding all the money into open source, which is like a symbol and icon of the communism is how I think about it. Like it's free stuff, you know? Um, so, so it's like us, like us getting money back from those like a bankers, and I it's just love that concept. Um, and then so uh, yeah, so that was uh, that was I think that that actually really moved the um, uh, the state of open source forward. Um, so it, so far, I looked at these like a three protagonists of uh, open source, right? Um, you know, the Richard Stone on the New Age to the um, the vendors like are doing the Game of Thrones and to the uh, world of startup. Um, but that wasn't the end of the story. Like these guys are still around, um, but um, they are not the uh, they are not the center stage anymore. So because there is somebody else in the center stage in the spotlight in the world of open source. Um, so that is where we are today. Um, and then I think of today's open source as era of end user companies. So. What do I mean by and these are companies? Right? These are companies um, who do not sell technologies to other companies. Right? So Sun, Microsoft, IBM, you know, they all sold that you know, they are doing this like uh, open source in part to sell technology to other companies. But now if you think about companies like um, you know, Netflix or Facebook or Twitter or Spotify, like these guys are actually in many ways leading the open source, but they are not in the business of selling technology. They are selling music or ad or uh, media or um, that, that sort of things. So I kind of find that like a interesting, quite an interesting change. Um, and the reason I think this is happening is because I think now the end users are leading the technology innovations because they are, you know, they are, they are they face interesting challenges at scale in ways that the many vendors do not. And then this was a kind of like a shocking revelation toward the end my my end of my tenure at some microsystems was that we are supposed to be creating this, you know, like a middleware of the server side applications. Um, but none of the people working there actually used it to build any significant services. So like we, in some sense, like we are, we are inventing the crap and hoping that this is gonna be useful. And it turned out that in the engineering, I think it's fundamentally a profession where a solution gets invented when there are problems. So if you don't really have a clear sense of what the problem is, you can't solve it. Um, so these, nowadays that's happening in, the, um, in, the, in these interesting end user companies. So they simply stopped waiting for the vendors to solve the problem for them. And at some point they decided that, okay, we need to solve our own problem. And then since they are not in the business of making money out of it, like, let's put it out there. Um, and then that's why I think, um, this, I think this, this change has happened. So it's quite telling in, in many ways, like a cloud providers, um, you know, they, they all started from their internal systems. Like Amazon wasn't originally started doing EC2 for the goal of seven years. They just needed it to run the bookstore, right? Um, so and the same is Google. Like they, they needed their platform to, to build their own search engine and other apps. So, so it, I mean, I kind of talked about the Microsoft as an evil company in a few minutes back, but Microsoft is really actually the only exception where they, you know, they are they are tech companies and they manage to build the cloud. So I think that just um, um, so that just like, uh, shows you how how awesome that company is. I think it really is a unique company. Um, so I guess in in, in some sense, like I love Microsoft. <laughs> but um, anyway, so but you know, that, what, why are these end user companies doing open source? Right? I think it's important to realize that they are not doing it out of philanthropy. Like it's not just giving back to the community uh, that, that they are doing this. And that's something I want to communicate here, right? Um, because I feel like, you know, like many of us, the engineers, when we want to do open source, like I feel like we are telling to our bosses and like the people around us, like, hey, you know, like we've been getting so much out of open source, like we should pay it back or like, you know, we should, uh, we should do our share. Like it's all great, like a moral value statement, but it's sort of like a devoid of the economic, like a calculation, right? Um, so, 
so that's I think um, so that's what I wanted to talk like why why are these end user companies doing open source so um, the clearly well some of the reasons are pretty easy to understand about and some of them are you know like some things for example are not uh, simply necessary but they are not the core asset like you have to do it because otherwise like you can't you, know, you can't have them uh, but uh, they are so these things are not asset these are liabilities. So natural, it's only natural to think like let's just cut the cost of building, you know, building those by doing things together. So most many of the systems that we create uh, in open source like they tend to be like a lower middleware, like a lower in the stack, like a login framework, whatever. Like all these things are not these are liability for most of the businesses. So let's not just invent a new thing. Right? But so this is a quite a viable pitch. Uh, but sometimes you know, but. Uh, like if you're open sourcing something and then hoping to just like you know, the, the twiddling your finger and waiting for the contributor to arrive, uh, well, I mean that's you know that's a kind of wrong approach. Like if the whole if the whole premise is to bring other people together to cut the cost, then that's something you need to go actively recruit. Right. So don't just don't just wait, but reach out to people um, and especially others in the same boat. So. And especially like if you're in the second or third in the market in your domain, then that's a great opportunity because you have other companies who are trying to like catch up with the uh, the like a leader in the, in the market, and then there's always appealing. You know, okay, we you know we need to kind of up the game. Like let's not compete on these liabilities. Like we all have to do it. Let's build this together. Um, so like sometimes I feel like people fall into the trap of a zero sum fallacy, as in like if you're you know, you're producing this for free, letting other people ride on top of it, like that, therefore like they must be getting the benefit and you're losing, which is actually not the case, right? I feel like open source is a great example of like a lifting tide uh, rises all the boat. Um, so I think this is a great pitch. Uh, however, that said. You know, building and designing something that works for multiple parties is fundamentally different from building something that only need to work for you. So I've seen a number of open source projects originally developed for some company. And then when they go out in open source, they have to spend lots of time reworking some of the some of the um, like a lower level planning so that they can accommodate multiple competing use cases and selectively use this and that. Um, like a spin Netflix Spinator was a great example. So that was a um, a CD tool that Netflix originally invented, like a wrote for themselves. And as they open sourced it, a lot of people liked it, the concept of it. But like when let's say like a Microsoft wanted to work on it, like they realized, oh, like this is fundamentally tied to AWS. So, they, not only, they couldn't just add the Azure support, like they have to embed the whole layer to do modularity. Um, and then these things take surprising amount of time. So if you're in the position to do, do this cost reduction play, that's something you need to watch out for, um, get the right um, technology work and then kind of communicate, convey the expectation that that's what's gonna happen. Otherwise people feel like, oh, like, you know, the, the spinnaker didn't like you know it, it hasn't changed a lot at all like you know but and that's yeah it's true from the user's perspective it hasn't changed but there's a kind of a necessary transformation happening within right so um but another reason a lot of companies do and user companies do open source is in order to appeal to developers because you know developers are in such a short supplies to the point that it's, it's crazy i hope um Many of you, I'm sure many of you feel the similar pain if you're involved in that sort of role. I mean, it's so this like the developer being in short supply is so bad that like, the price is going up to a ridiculous number. Um, and now I'm on the side of a uh, like I needing to hire engineers by the way we're hiring. Um, and uh, so like I can really see it, like in the especially in the Bay Area, uh, the, the price that the developers command is incredible. So Companies need every possible means to like create a sex appeal for developers, and then open source is is um, is clearly one of those. So, in some sense, like you can almost think of open, some companies and like think of open source as almost as a part of the recruiting effort. You know, because as a developers, you know, we wanna uh, you know like if you think about how we get feel how we feel rewarded or how we earn respect. Um, as I mentioned, I think open source actually plays a very critical part to it because most of us are working for 
you know, a company where the source code, the program that we produce never leaves outside the company firewall, right? So all the beautiful, amazing work that we do is completely invisible to anybody else. So that's, um, you can imagine how that's unmotivating uh, compared to, you know, like, let's say, like I wrote Johnson who did Spring, like, and you can see the code he wrote and uh, like his name is well recognized. Um, and then, so that's the, I think, the part of the, oh, like a wow factor they are trying to bring in. Um, and then another sort of a more subtle part of it is, you know, I feel like we engineers, we all want to work for a company who is practicing a sophisticated software development process, right? Like, well, there's no, with, I mean, no disrespect, but I, I don't know if enough people want to work for um, companies doing, like a you know, bank is doing lots of COBOL systems on the mainframe from 50 years ago. I bet they want to have a trouble recruiting like, you know, people. So, in some sense, like these open source projects show, like, are useful to show off the engineering level, high engineering level of a particular organizations. So, you know, that, that they have this, that, that in some sense, that they have to solve this particular kind of problem shows how far ahead they are in the game. Like if you think about the Lyft doing Envoy, like when, as an engineer looking at it, you can tell that, oh, like these guys must be doing microservices to such a degree. Right, they needed to, they saw this as a problem and they had to solve it. Right? And then you want to be working for that kind of company to kind of absorb this like a head of the curve, like a modern technology trend. And that would make the engineer more valuable in the next day. So it's almost like a dog whistle. Um, and then that's, uh, I think, an important part of the recruiting effort. Um, so, you know, that said, so, I mean, then that the kind of ties to the employee happiness. It's not just for recruiting new people. Um, because at the end of the day, I feel like engineering isn't really the uh, isn't really the center of the universe, right? Like it's the discretion of what to build uh, is less in our hands. I think we clearly control like how stuff is built, um, but um, you know how valuable it is. Uh, how valuable is a beautiful masterpiece if nobody can see it, right? So I think in many ways we being able to work on highly visible open source projects is giving the opportunity for engineers, like of people working in the company to feel happy and to stay engaged. Um, and then so that's, I think is also an important part of the uh, calculation for justifying why open source makes a business sense. Um, so in many ways, I think, you know, the, if, if you're in the uh, engineering leadership role, then this is the kind of things I think uh, engineering leaders can do for their organizations. So one is to create a scheme that, allow, that allows people to show off their engineering excellence to outside, right? So that requires you know, helping stakeholders around them, many, most of them non-technical, to understand why these things are valuable for their companies, like better recruiting or employee, employee happiness. Um, and then, you know, you can rally the organization around. Um, or, um, and you, you don't want to just rely on the good wheels of the developers and their desire to be open source, like you can provide a lot of coverage. Um, and then, so there are many ways to show off this kind of um, engineering excellence that needs to be combined together. So open source is one of them, but it's usually not the only thing. Um, so event appearance, like a blog post, like the foundation participations, like employee interviews, like all these things collectively tell a story. So. I think if you paint the picture like that, then I think you'll find a lot of nodding heads in people around you, uh, as opposed to, hey, open source is good for like a social moral good. So I, I found like HR to be my friend when I wanted to push open source in the company. They have metrics like how many days uh, their positions are open to close developers. Um, and if you can show a dent in those numbers, then that's easy way to justify why these things are good. Um, and then in doing all this work, like your influence as the engineering leader inside the organization is going to also increase. So that's good for you too. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so um, so these, I think that's, uh, these are the kind of things um, that, that matters. And if you, just in case you're feeling like, oh, well, you know, I'm just a frontline soldier, or like I'm not, I'm not in a leadership role. Like one thing I want to tell you is it's kind of like, it's not so much like you get promoted into the leadership role and start doing things, doing these things. It's the other around. Like a company promotes people who are working above their altitude. 
Um, so if you, you start to think and act like an engineer and you join in the company, we'll make you one. Um, so these, like if you, if you want to make this kind of, if you want to see this kind of change happen in your org, then it, this would be a great opportunity for you to actually start leading in that, in that space. Um, and then, you know, then, then the world gets more open source, which I love. And this is what the, uh, uh, I guess the Gandhi said it once, right? Um, like, a, what would it be the change uh, if you seek or something like that? So I think that this would be a great example. Um, so, um, and then if I may go for a little bit on tangent, um, um, I think, you know, I think the developers like, around the world, like across the whole industry, I think we need to unite. I think you know, one of the things I want to really make it happen is like, we deserve our version of the um, Academy Award. You know the Academy Award, like the movies, the Hollywood does it every year. Like they bring out the entire uh, professions around the movies. Now, the most famous ones, like the best movie or best actor, so those everyone can see, but they actually have a lot of categories for people who aren't so visible, like the you know, best, um, uh, one is the best hairstylist or like a best um, screenwriters and so on. So, or best lighting, best cameraman and so on. So these are kind of designed to celebrate like an invisible part of their industries. And I think we need the same thing in engineering. Like we should celebrate like the great engineering accomplishments or maybe like whether individuals or teams. And then we should have this like all sorts of categories. Like, I don't know, like the best SRE team or like a, Best middleware or whatever, um, and then the whole idea is to cast the spotlights, the roles, and people who aren't normally visible. Um, and then, like, we should let the winners proudly wear that badge on their resume, like, I put them on their company website, you know, like, and make other people notice. Um, and these visible repetitions that doesn't close within the company, I know it's going to get the eyes. Um, um, I, I know it gets attention, like you know, people would start feeling, oh, I guess the engineering team in your company must be pretty good because they won this award, right? Like if you think about the marketing people in your company, like they have no clue what you're doing, but they surely they understand the award. Uh, so that's a whole idea. Um, and uh, you know, if, if people start, can start building their repetitions that's not close to the company, then I think it's going to increase the liquidity of the engineers. Like it help, makes it easy for us to go from another one place to another. And when people move around, our salaries also go up. And so I think uh, collectively, we can do ourselves a great service just by celebrating like a busy big unit ourselves. So I'm pitching this every time, wherever I go. Um, so I think that's gonna be amazing. So I think that's gonna raise the tide for every engineers and then the same for engineer leaders. Um, so we, I'm looking forward to seeing our version of uh, Academy Award. Um, but anyway, like I digressed. So, so I talked a lot of ways in which like open source can make you know economic sense. So I think that for me the greatest case study of that is a Netflix OSS. So um, uh, so Netflix, I don't think Netflix as a company need interactions, but at one point, I think maybe ten years ago at this point, like they open sourced their middleware stack. Um, so they you know they needed to write a lot of services, and apparently some parts of Netflix so. Like, okay, let's build like a common platform together so that the engineers can be productive. But the great, the great thing about them is they didn't stop them, stop there, and then they just open sourced it. Um, but that wasn't the only thing. If that was the only thing they did, like they wouldn't be this big. Uh, they also combined this with a technology blog. So it wasn't just the, um, the source code, but it was talking about this explanation and narrative of why these pieces kind of work together to enable the cutting edge development practices. Um, and then they did a media campaign tied up with AWS because this was around the time AWS needed some iconic companies who are doing the cloud native. Right? They are having trouble painting this clear picture of what kind of software development that cloud needs to look like. And then so Netflix kind of fit the bill. So they went everywhere. By talking about like, uh, how awesome the Netflix as an engineering organization is. Um, and then, you know, it's actually, but these are as carefully manicured public image. And if you actually was inside Netflix, you, you'd have noticed like the things weren't that rosy inside. You know, it was a company who grew up very quickly. So, like, lots of people doing lots of things in every pocket. So, what they did was they used this platform team, used this external visibility to drive the standardization within the company. 
you know, like, you know, so in some sense, this marketing campaign they're putting to the rest of the world also worked for the developers within the company. So this platform that they, I'm seeing on this like I know, AWS reInvent and all the, our technology blog, that, that, that's look good, right? So we should be using it. So they were able to use that to drive more standardization within the company. Um, and then they did this developer event. I showed up in one of those. And, you know, to, so they are like, it kind of makes, they make it and look and feel like uh, meetups. But if you go there, recruiters are waiting to take your like a contact information. So they know how, like they are doing the free sourcing, like it's amazing. Um, and then the perception of Netflix, like among developers went up quite visibly, right? So like, I'm sure you've seen how awesome these like a chaos, chaos engineering, like that came from Netflix, right? So all these things really like improved the perception that we have to the Netflix engineering organization. And the leader, like Adrian Hopcroft, like he became famous for that. And then he didn't stay in Netflix, right? He used that creativity to go to, uh, I think he did a, uh, like a venture capital once a few years, and then he moved on to Amazon. So like he was, like he went into a completely different career trajectory uh, because of this. So that is the, like, you know, this is a kind of like open source play that has a strategic value to the company. Right, like it's it's kind of knocks off so many like bars with one stone. It's kind of crazy. So this is like you can imagine, you can see how this is different from you know like somebody some engineer in some team thought oh this is a useful library so let's open source it. Like it's a much more strategic move. Um, like it's like a there's a difference between almost like a kids baseball league versus like a major league baseball kind of like altitude difference going on here. Um, so when I talk about the economic viability of open source, like this is the kind of thing I'm talking about. I think there's a lot of opportunity to paint this kind of big picture and then mobilize a bigger part of the company and then get yourself promoted and then make more bigger money. And then the world gets more open source. So like it's a win, win, win all across. Right. Um, so um, let's just talk, a, let's talk a briefly about the open source program office. Now to use open source strategically like Netflix did, I think this is a kind of key level to have. So I think enough people consume open source that I don't think like an inbound aspect of the open source program office needs further explanations. Like you need to educate people about how to consume those, like a licensees, like what it takes to comply with those terms, like all of that media stuff. But what I want to spend a little more time on is like outbound. Like if you're trying to like a rally the organization so they can capitalize on open source in let's say way like Netflix so they able to do, um, it's the outbound that we should think about. So um, I, I mentioned this before, but I think it's important to clarify um, the benefit of uh, contributing to open source for the organizations. Like, um, I think the, for technology people, it's obvious, but the, the you know, business is mostly in other technology people. So you need to frame this in ways that like furthers the goal of the organizations. Um, so I gave you some of those slides. Um, and then like open source program office also should be working with the legal and branding. Like these are like a grinding pain for work that needs to happen before the company can sign off doing anything in the open source, like often. And then the engine, if you ask the engineers to take on, like that's enough to struggle to dissuade them from, from, uh, from continuing to do open source. So that's an important thing that the open source program office can cover. Um, and then the, the sort of things might be sort of less obvious, but um, there's actually a gap between so, so, um, so it's the engineers in the various business who had these challenges, and then they just, they choose to solve it by this brilliant code. So they are the one that's mainly pushing the project forward. Uh, but there's a gap between what they want to do versus like the corporate open source objectives that I mentioned that that's necessary to tie to the business. So it's things like a designing, I'm talking about this like a user interface design or web design and marketing, community management, or dealing with the modular ID or processing inbound PRs. All of that requires effort and time. And those are not like aligned with the BU's goals. Like the BU is trying to maximize their profit. And for them, this project is just a means to the end. So their engineers are always tied to that goal. So 
some additional things need to be plugged in from outside. And I think of the open source program of this as a place to do it. So um, if most of the place, so, you know, one thing I want, I always wanted to try, like I didn't get around doing it, even though Kirby was like, I know I wanted the, I think the open source program office is a great place to like be a rotating, you know, it's like you, you don't need this to be a full-time role, like a full-time full, full position. I think this would be a great position to turn it into rotating position. So let's say like every month you bring in somebody um, and then like I let them work on say, you know, inbound PR processing, um, it's kind of like a sabbatical, except it's not sabbatical within the company. So, you know, I, I think in, I find um, in many teams, there's always some engineers who are not like a fully passionate, fully engaged, like they, they're just kind of disillusioned. They're kind of like sort of looking for a change or they need time to be charged. I think the open source program is a great place to like let them happen. Because the whole goal of the open source is like you, you want, you want you want to make it really easy for new people to join the project and make some impact and move on. Like most of the open source contributors are like full time people. Like they they just they're they're what I call drive by contributors almost. Like they had some specific hits, they solve it, and then they move on. So like a project needs to be really accessible to these new people. So when the open source program office itself is constantly consisting of new people then they constantly feel this pain of what's making it difficult for new people to join. But I think it's a, it's a great way to make a rotation happen. Um, and then you know, if it's only, if you're only putting out like an engineer one month, it's, it's like, it's just long enough that it's valuable for them, but it's short enough for their managers that they, they want like a higher replacement. So I think it's like a great thing. So, uh, anyway, um, I think uh, so I talked a bit about the open source program of this, but really, like, if you're seriously looking into this, it's the, and I think the Linux Foundation has this excellent open source guide for the enterprise. And you can see a few, um, like a lot of uh, people who know what they're talking about, spending a good amount of time capturing their thoughts in this. So I highly encourage recommend this material. All right. So, so that's today. So where is open source going? Um, and that's a kind of fool's errand to try to predict the future. But you know, that's okay. I just want to like, say whatever I want to say. So um, I, I'm really sort of, I think the Linux Foundation is a very interesting organization. It's like, it's different from many other open source foundations that was the centerpiece of the previous era. Um, so why is that? I think it's partly because in Linux Foundation, the companies are first class citizens. In Apache, for example, it's not. So GNU, like if we, in the FSF, it's almost fundamentally against this kind of like a corporate software development. So Linux Foundation is truly unique in that regard. And what do you mean by company being first class citizens? You know, the Linux Foundation has this business development people, like whose job is to work with like a corporate folks. It's all, they have their own sales and marketing engines. They have a customer relationship management with the uh, open source people in various vendors. Um, and they have this mechanism to convert this participation from the companies into money. Like you have to pay in like every participating company needs to pay in like, you know, tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars a year to Linux foundations, right? So in some sense, like they're siphoning off that money and then they, they're converting that money into people of specific skills that's difficult to get, like designers, um, the community managers, uh, documentation, like all these, you know, the open source project has a built-in mechanism to attract engineers, but it, the, the, the incentive just doesn't work for people of other professions, right? So the next foundation can actually use the money to do that. Um, and then that's, I think that never happened. I don't think it used to be a open source before in that foundation. So, um, and then they're also very pragmatic. Like they understand the economic viability, like how to make things move forward um, in ways that's not relying on ideology. So that I think I value that a lot. Um, and another thing I'm sort of seeing is like a more accelerated movement in building undifferentiated commodities together, right? So I think the open source that I, I grew up with are you know, the stuff that's done for engineers, by engineers, like the compilers, operating system, middleware, it's all the stuff that we use, right? But I think the future of the open source 
is actually more more of that is happening in a specific business domains um, and then building stuff um, that's not targeting for developers um, it's like a, it's 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 a result of a careful consideration of where we are competing like where we need to like build together um, so it's like a very strategic decision it's like a great example of that is um Academy Software Foundation, since I mentioned about the Academy Award. So, so this is um, like, a, if you look at this Academy Software Foundation, you'll see the participants is like a who's who of the movie industry, like a DreamWorks, Disney, Warner Brothers, Sony Pictures, and so on. So you know, they're all making movies together. Uh, well, they're all competing when it comes to making movies, but they realize like some of the stuff that they need to make movies a highly like a software driven uh, like a visual sound effect and all that stuff um when they are they, they correctly recognize that they are commodities they are necessary liabilities uh but they are not differentiated like they you know nobody goes to go see a movie because the software they use to produce them is good right that's just not ha gonna happen um so, and then one, another amazing thing about like this Academy Social Foundation is the hardware vendors also part of it. Like if you think about companies like NVIDIA, like they are kind of like, their challenge is they're commoditized in different ways. Like they, are, they do not usually have a direct access to their customers that they are trying to appeal to. They are often like pushed behind the common API. So they cannot really deliver their differentiated innovations to their customers without middleman, like um, I guess in this case, like AWS or um, like a Maya or something. So, you know, the NVIDIA, it makes sense for NVIDIA to join the Academy Software Foundation because now they can deliver, they can work directly with their, their customers. Um, and uh, so that was a great example. Like I, I was in Linux Foundation event the other day and I met with a guy from Allianz, like a big insurance company. And then uh, they are saying they are working together with Microsoft to bring some of like an insurance platform. Like they said, one of the things that like, every insurance company has to do is to keep the record of all the uh, insurance contracts. And that has to survive for multiple decades, which makes sense. So they need a computer system to deal with it. But again, it's not a differentiator, it's a commodity. So they are building these things and offering that into a service. I saw a similar movement in the e-government, like a city of Paris is open sourcing the software that they use to run the city. Um, because, you know, there are lots of cities like Paris that uh, could benefit from them. Um, and then city of Paris shouldn't be putting all the bill, right? Um, and then what's different is that this US foundation that I mentioned in the previous slide, um, they are in the business of creating this kind of open source foundation wherever the opportunities arise as they can profit from it essentially right so now there's like there's an economic machine that's there to like make this more smooth and that's making the thing move so much faster so and this is a kind of like a strategic level the open source is playing a role like you can actually i'd imagine in the dreamworks board um they talked about this let's build this let, let's open source this or our you know, visual effects um, programs that we develop to uh, do whatever, uh, because it's in our interest. And that's a pretty significant conversation. So that's the kind of play that the open source is doing nowadays. So really, um, I think open source is going places and it's only gonna go grow, right? I think you know, it's in so many ways, you know, develop, for developers, like it's a means to get their names known in the world stage. You know, it's a means for connecting developers across the world. I already mentioned that this is the best ever software development method that we have ever invented. You know, open source prevents this kind of monopoly rent-seeking activities um, that the, these end user can get trapped by. Um, it's a way to like ask the you know, join hands across the corporate boundaries and like I move the common ball forward. And it's expanding domains beyond the technology middleware and it's driving, it's bringing a better economic viability. So really like there's so much more to like uh, that you can do beyond just writing patches. Like there's nothing wrong with writing patches, but there are so much more opportunities. So, so grab them and in doing so, you will be also doing good to the world. So, you know, please like make a difference. So on that note, I think uh, um, I'm gonna, I think this is the end of what I wanted to talk about. So.
any 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 thoughts questions i hope i didn't uh, put you down back to sleep yeah i think we have five minutes for questions did i completely lose the audience i'm sorry if this didn't resonate at all Does, um, okay, since uh, there's nobody, well, if you're speaking, I think you're muted, so please do check. Um, I guess is, uh, how, is, um, how is the open source scene in Singapore? Like, the, is that a pretty active part of the tech scene over there? Or like, do people feel like we are mostly just on the consuming side without producing? I'm trying to think like if I know any open source projects that came from Singapore, I can't think of any. That would um. be here. It's a good question. Maybe I can answer from what I know. Uh, maybe you guys have, maybe my colleague will have more perspective as well. But for me, uh, actually, when I moved to Singapore, I was very keen on knowing like who is contributing. Uh, the only people I knew were like two like very active contributors on the J Hipster project. Oh yeah, yeah, okay. And yeah. but the thing is that they are still contributing to J Hipster, but they moved out of Singapore. So. <laughs> Ah, so, okay. So the, oh, that, the, that, that could be great, though. I mean, if that, uh, I don't know. I mean, the, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know that project well enough in terms of like our origin and history, but maybe that let them do some job opportunities outside. So that could yes, be yeah, yeah, it is. Definitely. And they moved to Europe, both of them, and, uh, yeah. and they are happy in Europe. And uh, yeah, Michael, do you know anybody who, in Singapore who? Actually, there is the trace together application, right? For uh, yeah, this kind of sorry, my oh, no. oh, I can hear you. Oh, okay, okay. Yes. yeah, yeah, so yeah, I think we cannot hear you anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Hi guys, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes, wonderful. I have a question actually. So, um, by the way, when you started open source and uh, kind of started contributing heavily to uh, the Jenkins project, how did you um, kind of divide the time? I mean, at some point, I suppose you, you had to give up the, I mean, just allocate all your time to the Jenkins project, right? And and how did the mm -hmm. transition go? I'm, I'm wondering. Uh, so so in that case, I was, so I was lucky. Um, um, so early on, like the sound, you know, sound was one of those big companies and then I, I wasn't, I wasn't kept busy enough. So like I had enough spare time. So the project started as my side thing, um, but I was using it at the workplace. And then over time, like a more and more of, of my group started relying on it. So like a pretty soon, like the next thing I noticed, um, the whole floor, like about 200 people, uh, people building Java, they, they needed Jenkins to kind of keep things going. So I used to say, oh, okay, so they find bugs or issues or like a suggestion. And I, I, I used to say, oh, okay, oh, that's a great idea. I'm going to work on this weekend and I'm going to come back next week. And at some point, my manager came and said, "Like, okay, this 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 problem is like, you know, we need we need this solved now. Like, so like you can work on it during the daytime. That's fine. Like, we need a problem solved." And so it's totally like I started into like, became a part of my day job. Um, so that was lucky. Um, I don't think like I think um, I know not everyone has that sort of luxury. Um, and then the sun kind of went down the tube and it became Oracle. And then, so that wasn't like, that wasn't a difficult choice for me to leave Oracle. <laughs> so, and then uh, so I kind of jumped to the direct company um, and then the rest is history. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks a lot, Kosuke. Okay, it's 9 a.m. here, so I think people are going to start their day job. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah. yeah.
Thank you very much. It was awesome to have you. It was a really great presentation. Thanks for and, the uh, Yeah, I'm sure we'll have you again soon in one of our meetups. Great. And then have a good day, everyone. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Cheers. Bye-bye.